Is the need to have a side hustle in the first place a sign of a broken profession? You know, why not just seek fair compensation for the work you're already doing? That's reality. I think that's been set for many, many years. But instead, you can change your own reality yes. of how you deal with that. I'm, I'm finding ways like you do is how to do what we love, why we went to architecture school, why we became architects is for the problem solving skills, those design skills. I want to keep all those. And I'm going to find a new way to make this profession work for me because I'm not just going to pack up my bags and leave. I, I, I need to find a way to do it for myself. Hey, Eric here with 30 by 40 Design Workshop. We're continuing on with the Modern Practice Series, speaking with Henry Gao today. He's a San Francisco-based architectural designer, photographer, illustrator, artist, and you may know him from his YouTube channel. He's also a content creator, so he wears many different hats. Henry and I first connected as he was a student enrolled in my architect and entrepreneur course. That's where I pull back the curtain and share everything about my own business operations, everything that's worked, everything that hasn't. And I created it to help designers find better clients, give them the freedom to do work that matters, and to earn more doing it. So Henry enrolled in the course as he was making this transition between freelancer and a full-time business owner. And I really do consider him to be a success story as he was able to scale his business since we first talked from making about $4,000 a month on the side to more than $10,000 a month today. Now we start our conversation with something that all design professionals are concerned with and struggle with, and that is compensation. If you could offer to somebody who's heading into architecture school, who's someone who's approaching architecture school. What do right. you wish you knew about that before heading into it? I think what one of the things that kind of caught me by surprise was just in reality, like how much are you going to get paid? Like what does, how does this profession pay? Yeah. Uh, where are you going to find meaningful work? And that tends to be in cities where, you know, are kind of like drive the economics in the U.S. They're, they're the, you know, the, the New York, the California kind of, these coasts, a lot of people that I talk to, they, 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 they don't realize what the profession pays. In the Bay Area where I'm currently, you know, resides, you're surrounded with Silicon Valley folks. So there is that energy of, <laughs> of tech. Sure. And then, you know, then you find out how much they make and you're right. like, what, what? It's shocking. I'm like living, ba I'm barely like living above poverty line and raising a family here. It is expensive. Yes. So it, it it dampens your kind of mood on, on this profession quite a bit. Certainly, you know, finances and money, what I, what I was going to make when I graduated, I didn't really have a lot of visibility into that. The other thing I didn't fully appreciate was how long it actually takes you to get to a point in a firm, you know, if you're working for somebody else right. to design something because you, you run through five years of school, right? Which in itself here in the U S at least getting your B right. arc is, is an extra year on, of education that you're paying for. But mm -hmm. by the time you get to the end of that, you're you're a hotshot designer and you're ready to leave school. It's nothing enter, like that. <laughs> right. And enter the workforce and you're suddenly, yeah. you know, doing all of these repetitive tasks, drafting other people's yeah. ideas. And I found that really deflating as someone who was coming into right. this profession. Whereas, you know, as you're com contrasting your friends in tech, uh, they're they're right at it coding day one. Right. I mean, they're solving problems day one. And so I think that for me was a, another point of contrast. I did want to kind of summarize for people where you're at right now. So you said you're early thirties, you, right. you've built this career for yourself. You've come out of school, you've interned, you've worked at various architectural firms, I presume, mm -hmm. but I'd like you to yeah. fill in the, fill in the gaps here. By the time I graduated from, from Cornell in my graduate school, I already had like six internships, which, wow. which sounded like quite a bit because, you know, in eight years time, I went to work in the Netherlands for Four, four people, two internships there. And then I just did a bunch of internships during school. And I took some time away from school just to work on more internships. So when I graduated, I had a really good sense of where I wanted to work, what kind of work that I would really excel, which, you know, as you know, like I have this great hand and I'm very in tune with presentation, with mm -hmm. rendering. Those were my early tool set or like skill set that I had wherever I went to interview, they people could see that. What may be true for most people is in the earlier career, they get pigeonholed into doing work that are not as interesting. But for me, it was a little different because they, they saw I had this skill set. I actually worked on interesting projects, but even that I felt tired. And that was at a corporate environment where I stayed for a year and a half. It, it was still very top down. You know, the top designer gave the things that you could, you know, continue. Yep. Right. And uh, I felt like my 
that the set of tool set wasn't really stretched. That's when I decided to work for a smaller firm. And when I went to work for a smaller firm, I decided I wasn't gonna work for them on a five day schedule. I, I negotiated into a four day work week. And that was very intentional because I had these side hustle and businesses while I was working for a corporate job, like renderings, I was doing photos, I was doing art. I just wanted to have more time to do more of these things. Like I think the it's the white space that I was mm -hmm. missing to be creative on a day that I didn't have work. So I negotiated into Monday to Thursday, and every Friday I would do whatever I want. I'm not even gonna look at work or think about work, and it was just gonna be a 32 hour work week. And my salary reflected that and was prorated to that package. Eventually, that white space allowed me to experiment. Running a e-commerce business where I sold my art on Etsy, uh, where I built, I would consider it as a boutique successful Etsy shop where sure. I sell my prints all over the world now. Um, and that also allowed me this white space to do more photography. Like I was interested in photography, but you know, I was also interested in architectural photography. So I experimented with taking better photos, investing in classes, self-learning, self-development. And uh, while at the same time, I was still a full-fledged designer at this smaller firm of less than 10 people. And in there, that's where I really felt like I excel as a designer because with a smaller firm, you get to do much more. Yep. And very fortunate for me, the principal trusted me with a lot of the design work. Even though I made a lot of mistakes very, very early on, <laughs> I was I was entrusted with a lot of design work. I think there was a curve, you know, where I was doing a lot of good work, was excel, I was excelling. And then at some point, you kind of plateau, right? Like you do a lot of the same stuff and then the work kind of like you slow down, you kind of find your system, your way of workflow, your design. And it was during that time where I introduced like a, a workflow on an iPad uh, where I ha used to have this big Wacom tablet and the iPad allowed me to design digitally. <laughs> and that was game over. I was the only person who was using this digital device to design and people around me were like, you're designing on that? <laughs> and your sketches look like they were drawn on paper? So the, the principal ended up getting everyone an iPad because I was I was showing you this is possible, right? Yeah. And uh, I that was my initial kind of uh, effort into teaching people in the office and showing the workflow and the ideas um, within a much smaller group before I eventually introduced and started a YouTube channel where I started to upload these techniques and workflow and the strategies to a broader audience. So that's how I kind of like arrived to where I am right now, where I'm more of a consultant employee and I work between 10 to 20 hours, sometimes l much less than that okay. as a architectural consultant, doing some of the su similar stuff as I was doing as a full-time employee, but just with less projects and less hours. Okay. You know, it gives me the lots of free time to do the other things that you're talking about that you're referring to. So right. you're, you're effectively a free agent. You're a freelancer, right? I mean, you have your own business. Technically. You, you, yeah. Right. Okay. I'm starting to see myself as a business much more than someone who is just freelancing because freelancing, yeah. you're still trading your time for money. But as businesses, you, you have to think about ways to scale your business and ways to leverage other people, not yourself, to increase productivity. But that's where the business is headed, is a business where uh, I myself can be location independent, so can the people that are working for me. I really like that idea where uh, where Tim Ferriss talks about in his four hour work week, to create the life that you want, Yeah. right? Yes. Create the lifestyle so that you can live to the fullest and you can, you can travel, um, you have, have the means to do it and you have the time to do it. Okay, and when I've... you work for yourself, when you're working for 40 hour a week <laughs> and we know it's not a 40 hour week, it's often 50, 60 hour weeks. Yes. You don't have time to, or the white space to think about these other things that I have the time to think about now. That's why I'm doing this and I'm not working for a traditional architecture company. I mean, I think the pandemic for all of the ills mm -hmm. that it introduced into society created right. one big opportunity, um, and that is people understanding that a life like yours is possible. Your most popular video on your YouTube channel is titled My Four Streams of Income as an Architectural Designer, and the thumbnail shows 
$4,000 per month. So what is a side hustle to you and why go down this path? You know, I mean, you, you were work, mm -hmm. you were getting to do all the things you could do. You wanted to mm -hmm. design architecture. You didn't actually have to find the jobs, right? You were working as an architectural designer for this other yeah. firm. You were doing work you enjoyed. You're rendering, designing. Sound like that sounds perfect. Like why pursue something else? I mean, was there something mm -hmm. wrong with that? Yeah. No, no, there's nothing wrong with doing a, a regular job. I think there's there's more to why I wanted to pursue it other than just like the interest and uh, a lot of it has to do in the earlier years in the first and second year had to do with um, being able to afford more as a yeah. young designer. Sure. I was single. I was working a somewhat balanced work life, and I had this extra time. And what kind of tip for me was even though some weeks I was working 20 more hours a week, but I was almost making as much money as I did with my side hustle compared to my full-time job. Not exactly as much, uh -huh. but I was I was working fraction of the time on the weekends, on the nights. But that gave me the the green light to tell myself I could be doing more of the side, side hustle things. I could be trading my time. I'm still trading my time at a hot, much higher rate than what I was getting compensated as a designer. And that was worth the, the gamble or the risk for me to reduce find a way to reduce the regular architecture work for an employer and do more of the side hustle. So it was definitely monetarily driven and financially driven to to take on these things. But those side hustles were also things that I enjoyed. These are the things I was really good at, that I excelled in school, that I wish I could have done more of in work, at work, but yeah. I wasn't. I was doing Revit work. I was doing like very mundane stuff. Like I had all this skill set that I wasn't being utilized for. So it, uh, it really pushed me into a direction where like I could be doing things I love, I could be making more, I could work less. Why wouldn't I do more of those things? You know, eventually that one side hustle, like the video show, that one side hustle became more because I suddenly had this white space to think about other things, other skill set that I can really turn into a both a serious hobby that can be monetized in some way too. And that became art, right? I, I always knew how to draw with pen and ink. I've, I've traveled a lot. Like I've, I've had beautiful photos taken uh, when I travel. Why do I make that into art? So that became a business by itself, and that it's a story by itself too. So that became a part of the, you know, the stream of income. You know, they say the average millionaire has nine streams of income, right? And as I look oh, down, all of the thing, yeah. all the things that you do. Can, can you just walk me through? Like, I mean, maybe it started with 3D renders, but it, now it's something else. Can you walk me through? Uh, each right. one of those? What, sure. what are your side hustles? Um, so the side hustles initially was a lot less than that and it grew over time. And yeah. nine is actually really accurate. I'm not saying I'm going to be a millionaire anytime soon, but <laughs> I can see nine stream of income being very viable at some time in the future. And now my different stream of income have actually grown since that video was published. Yeah. So if we were to start from the beginning, the first side hustle was 3D renderings, right? right? And that wasn't hand drawing. That was just 3D illustration. That was rendering for people that didn't have the in-house renderers to to do that work. You can find that work almost anywhere nowadays on Upwork or any right. any any other places. And then people are charging very competitive rates. Um, but at the time, I was charging you know good good rates. I felt like so that was that was number one, which I actually phased out because that was again trading my time for money. Sure. I didn't want to do that. So yeah. that was number one. And eventually there was the art, right? There was the art on Etsy, which I still do now. And that was a better trading my time for money thing because there's a scalability to that. I can hire someone to package my right. art for me. And then photography, architecture photography, I can actually make a living if I wanted to. I can see that. A lot of that has had to do with the visualization kind of path sure. because yeah. there was so much transferable skills sure. from yeah. how you compose a shot to how you edit in Photoshop, there were just so many skills that are directly transferable. So to me, it was very natural. It wasn't hard to do, to 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 make that right. into a stream of income. You've got illustration, obviously, right? You're right. Illustration. It was a thing that came up after the rendering too. Rendering just took so much time. Like a, a single drawing can take 15, 20 hours. Yeah. And it was really hard to compete with these people that were charging very nominally. Uh, fee from countries like India or China. It was very hard to compete with them. Yeah. But I realized uh, from doing art, I had this, I can turn that. It's also very transferable to hand rendering. And there were people that are looking for 
and illustrators. And I think there's a shift into uh, hand drawing much, much more. So that I do that now uh, pretty actively, actually, on a weekly basis, I would say. There's a need for it. You're also, you're doing architectural design. You have, right. I presume, there's a teaching component to what you're doing? I mean, as you're making things, you're also putting a camera above your desk and sharing right. information? Absolutely. So a lot of these things can overlap. Like when I'm doing a architectural study or when I'm doing rendering, a lot of that is just to process that uh, and document it, right? You might be using that for a, a teaching moment somewhere down the road. You never know. You've got a YouTube channel, which I presume mm -hmm. earns some money, maybe from advertising so revenue. Once I started to teach on YouTube, sharing my knowledge on YouTube, and talking to you actually from a year ago, it opened up so many more doors that I didn't realize was possible uh, when you were building a personal brand. And initially, it was a YouTube business. Even before it was monetized, I wasn't earning ad revenue, but I did have a, a resources that I was selling or right. giving out for free mm -hmm. on you know places like Gumroad, which is a place where you can upload these digital files and people can either donate or pay for them. So that quickly became a source of revenue, even though it wasn't a lot at the time, but it did bring in like, you know, what's a couple hundred dollars a month? That's pretty good, um, you know, over a year yes. for, a, for a young person. So that was something that I didn't anticipate until I had to talk to you. And eventually the YouTube uh, channel became monetized and that was a passive source of income by having YouTube bringing you know, bringing a couple hundred dollars a month too, which is also like when once you start adding these up, it becomes to kind of uh, become a larger sum. What really uh, occurred to me could be a better way to monetize and leverage my audience and my skills was actually creating a product. And you mentioned this in, in the past. That's where I started looking at creating a course. And what better way to create a course than to package the YouTube content that I had already been doing into a much more succinct and concise format with individual lessons that people can watch without hunting down all the videos, who knows where to start into a package, a course, a material, a training, a workshop that people can take with me. In turn, it became an evergreen product that I can sell uh, all year long. Okay. So that became a much greater, I think, source of income for me. And I can see much, much more potential from that. Sure. So, so you have this, you're creating systems. I mean, everything you're speaking about here, I hear side hustles, but the way, right. you know, the evolution of this moved from trading your time to creating something where there's a scalable system in place that can earn revenue, the, Absolutely. the passive dream, yeah. right? While you sleep. Right. And, and that's exciting <laughs> to me, but here, here's, I'm going to push back on the side hustle thing a little bit, and I'm sure you've sure. heard this before. And actually, if I read through the comments on that most popular video on your channel, people say, Hey, is the need to have a side hustle in the first place a sign of a broken profession? Why not pay somebody more to do the work that you're doing? You know, that's just that that's a real reality. I think that's been set for many, many years. But instead, you could do is you can change your own reality yes. of how you deal with that. I'm, I'm finding ways like you do is how to do what we love, why we went to architecture school, why we became architects is for those problem solving skills, those design skills for those um, uh, for, for your vision. Right. I want to keep all those and I'm going to find a way find a new way to make this profession work for me because I'm not just going to pack up my bags and leave. You're paving the way for for many young generations of architects. And I feel like there needs to be more voices like that. So my answer to that is if you want, just change the way that you want to live and work and take the risk. I mean, it's in the DNA of an architect to want to change reality, mold and shape reality into an ideal vision of what we want. And when right. I see comments like that, I you know, aside from feeling a little bit, um, I get, I get my, my backup a little bit about it. Um, yeah. I, it makes me realize that not everybody is programmed to being an entrepreneur and starting things on their own. And, you know, really, I think it is part of the creative spirit that I see expressed on your YouTube channel, in your illustrations, like it's all alive and singing and I can see it in your work too, that this, these are things that light you up. Why not pursue it? Like who cares if it's a side hustle or not? And I don't know of all those things. Maybe you don't call them or classify them as side hustles anymore. For me, as I'm working on one thing like that, that's the main hustle at that moment. And I can change that main hustle to be model building or sketching or making a video or whatever I want it to be at this point. And that's, right. 
ultimately a really creatively empowering place to be. It's common for new graduates to who are working long hours, they're doing maybe repetitive tasks, they're not the chief in the office, <laughs> chief designer in the office, um, to feel like they're undercompensated. Um, as an employee, obviously, you're limited by what your employer is willing to pay you for your time. Okay. As a business owner yourself, how have you <laughs> thought about compensation? Like, how has it changed for you over time? And, you know, share as much as you're comfortable sharing, just to paint the picture of I was working for somebody else and now I'm working for myself. Is it different financially? Is it better? Is it worse? You know, working for somebody else, you're you're definitely at their kind of uh, how much they're willing to pay you. And sure, you might get you, you might be getting paid more as somewhere else for someone in your position. But that little increase in money is what, maybe 10, 20 percent at the most when you jump jobs. So it's not like a life changing difference when you're starting out from school. Let's say your graduates starts maybe like 60,000, 70,000 a year. So from 70 to 80,000 a year. That may seem like a lot on paper, but after taxes are taken, that doesn't amount to a lot, right? So you're the the time that you are trying to negotiate for that little bit more, which is within the tolerance of negotiation, you can you can use that time and you can increase your earning potential far more if you just take on any of the side hustles that I've been doing. Like for example, my my art business can easily bring in 20 grand a year if you focus on that, and that would take you less than a couple of hours a week to to do it if you if you kind of streamline the process. So to me, the side hustles, the, all the business ideas, it definitely amounts to more than what someone can be making at a corporate job, much, much more, two or three times more. Um, I'm very com comfortably making more than six figures a year and uh, and working, you know, a lot less than yes. what someone might be working at a corporate firm. You can't just scale your time, but if you build an effective system, your system can scale when you leverage uh, your effort into, let's say, YouTube creation. When you drive more traffic to your, to your email list, that can scale your system very quickly. If one of your video blows up, that can really blow things up in your system too. So the beauty of that is the scalability. Yeah. But in terms of financial results, running your business is always gonna make you um, make you more money in the end. Otherwise, why why even start one in the first place, right? <laughs> no, you're, you're taking on more risks. You deserve to make more. And how how much I'm paying myself is um, is all. I think it's not that relevant because you pay yourself as much as you need to 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 do the things that you want in life. And if you have excess, just invest it back into the business. Whether that's in terms of uh, hiring the right people to help you do things faster or getting better equipment to make you things do faster. So whatever I'm thinking about paying myself is really about just 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 pay myself what I need to to run the business and anything else I can invest back into the business and myself and my own career and my own learning. I think you're yourself your best um, asset if you yes, can right. be healthy, right? I mean, I love this idea of um, increasing your income can change your lifestyle. It can also change your professional trajectory. Um, right. You have just different choices, right? I mean, right. creating that white space allows you to say, oh, I'm really interested in doing that today. Um, whereas if you're working for an employer, you're beholden to their schedule. How do you think about work-life balance? Since I know, I mean, this is a huge part of starting your own business. I mean, you hear about people starting something and spending 80 hours a week and you're working every weekend, every single moment. Um, talk to me about how you think about work-life balance. You know, I, I think it's really hard when you are working at home to be detached from your own office to your living room. Yes. So, and sometimes I do work at night, right? If I, if, and, and you have to just be very careful. I have to be very careful with how I spend my day. Mm -hmm. And uh, often I have a tracker. I use a tracker. I, I keep a tally of how much time I'm working a week. So at the end of the week, I can look back on it um, objectively and see where I've spent my time. Am I spending too much time where I should be spending less time? So if my if my goal is to work anywhere from 24 to 32 hours a week, then I have to think about what projects I'm going to work on this week. Mm -hmm. So, and it doesn't really matter when you work on it. You can work on it during the day or at night. 
the beauty of it is now during the daytime, I can go take a walk with my wife or go on a hike for two hours Love and that. then come back and do the work in the evening when most people will be watching Netflix anyways. So the work-life balance to me is really how to how do you enjoy your life more but still get the work done and yeah. in a way where it's not compromising um, family, play, pleasure, and people. So these are things that I want to have. And I think as a small business owner, you're so easily being sucked into an 80 hour work week because there's so much to do, right? And it's very easy just to do all these things. And uh, having a family actually helps because now you are you need to be more aware uh, of, of how you spend your time because it will impact not just you now, it will impact right. the rest of the family. You know, it's interesting, you you mentioned it uh, being risky to start your own business, but I, I, I actually push back on people when they say that because, mm -hmm. You know, when you're working for someone else, the risk is that they're controlling the purse strings, they're controlling your work schedule, finding new work is up to them. And if they don't find new work, you could be out, uh, you know, on your feet. Absolutely. And yeah, I, and you're... That, that's a concern right now, right? Mm -hmm. As we're facing yeah. a recession. Um, right. How do you how do you feel about, you know, the idea that we might be entering a recession? Like, are, is it scary to you? Is it empowering. I mean, you have all of these income streams in place. Like you're not relying right. on a sole employer. To me, it would seem like it would prop you up. Right. Yeah, it's a good question. And given the recession is, you know, if, if it's not really like, you know, here, right. it's just gonna get it could get worse. And a lot of people who have a steady job can see that as a stable stream of income, which most people actually see that as a stable stream of income. But you have to be very careful. What if the company furloughs? What if they lay out people? What if what if there's no work? What if there's a cash flow problem? You don't get paid. And suddenly that one steady stream of income is no longer that steady anymore. And uh, I mean, you could have savings, but then you're dipping into all your savings if you just lose your job. Um, what I can see myself do is is risky because you're kind of like you are relying on yourself, on your own performance to to be able to run a business. But if one leg is lost, you still have like eight legs to sit on. Yes. And though they might not be as much as what you were making before, but I think it will allow your burn rate to if you have a burn rate like your savings, it can allow you to last far, far longer because the the the, the stability actually comes from many streams of income like a millionaire would would have. Some might be more, some might be less, but altogether, they're not all going to go away. I think the business that you built makes you such a nimble professional because I mean, you've done all of these experiments at the time someone realizes they're out of a job and they need to start, you know, pooling together assets or create different right. diversified income streams. You've already run 50 experiments, so you know which 25 actually don't work. If someone's watching this and they are envious of your position, working 32 hours a week, you have time for your wife, your kids, you know, you're, you have this model life. You're, you're earning more than you did when you were working for somebody else. If someone wanted to replicate your approach, where would you advise them to start? It's interesting because as we're, as I'm talking to you, I didn't realize all the dots and the, the milestone or the steps that I had to take in order to get to where I'm today, because I would not make the transition from like, rendering to doing YouTube that just wouldn't I don't think that would happen and the drawing and iPad and stuff So I think if I were to give someone the shortcut Maybe think about how can you help somebody else get somewhere where you wanted to go faster? Doesn't matter where it is and a, a great book uh, that I read not too long ago was go giver and uh, It's a book that talk about like, you know, the more you give the more you'll receive so I really resonate with that concept and I can see it actually in my business uh, exactly in my business because as soon as I started to share my knowledge on YouTube on content with contents that I think other people will find invaluable I started seeing huge growth in my business. What does your practice look like in five years? Any ideas or are you just living day to day trying to enjoy it? No, I, I, I thought I thought a lot about this too. Also, I was heavily inspired by our conversation a year, more than a year ago. I, I don't mean to copy you exactly, but I wanted to just like uh, do what I still enjoy, you know, in the design world, but do it at my own pace. If that means taking one or two clients uh, a year and then have the rest of the income come from other sources where I don't need to be as involved. That would be the goal and the perfect ideal would be location independence. Oh. I think that 
is more valuable to me than to be able to do awesome, awesome work. Like I want to be able to, my kids are super young right now, but I want to at a point to take my family out to work at a different country for a month in a year and right. still be able to run the business from there. So whatever decisions I make is anchored to those ideals and those vision. If I'm taking a project, I'm thinking about does it fit into that plan? If it doesn't, then I'm not going to be making those moves, even if it fits into like the finance part of the plan. But if it doesn't fit into that, um, that overall five year plan, then then that's not how I want to drive my business. If you asked me a year ago, I wouldn't know where to tell you this answer, but it's these visions that I borrow from other people that I can really see uh, being integrated in myself that I feel like it is, even though it was it was not an original idea from me, it is, it, that's, that's original to me. But I mean, we all do that, right? I mean, when right. you first start off in this profession, you, you don't know anything about architectural design, right? You're just copying right. others. You're copying Zumthor and you're copying oh, yeah. Jim Cutler, yeah, well, whoever it might be, right? And that kind of collaging happens internally. And I mean, the same right. is true for business. You're looking at other professionals, whether they're photographers or artists or writers, and you're, you're yeah. creating your own system and collage based on the things that inspire you from them. And I... I think that's amazing that people can do that. I'm not sure everyone can do that. You certainly have proven that you're capable of doing that. And what I find, you know, for my own business is that mm, once right. I, once I show that that can actually support me and my family in ways I'd never predicted, that's just, that just kind of builds this momentum of the flywheel and it, you keep doing more and more of it. So, you know, in some ways having a five-year goal and a vision is great because it does set you up the, the decisions you're making right now. It sets you up for that right. five-year vision, but also right. I couldn't have predicted where I was going to be five years ago. Um, and I'm not sure I can predict the next five years either, but it's just exciting knowing that I have so many different options that I can take. And when I open this yeah, door, it's amazing. Yeah. there's a thousand other doors. Yeah. More and more, the architectural profession is being reinvented by creative professionals like yourself. Um, people who are refusing to accept the status quo as is. And I find your story super inspiring and I, I'm just really appreciative of your time and I wish you all the best, Henry. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you, Eric. <laughs>